everybody, welcome back to the ECG channel. My name is Reed, and today we've got a really fun ECG case study here that we're going to deep dive into. If you want to follow along with this and make your own notes, don't forget that you can download the PDF document linked in the description below. And if you enjoy this content, the best way to support the channel is to subscribe. So let's jump into it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the force. What that means is we're just going to get an idea of what's going on with this rhythm. And so maybe I come down here to lead two, and I see I got a regular rhythm. The rhythm itself seems to stay regular the entire strip. And so when I zoom in and check the rate out, I find a QRS that lands on a solid line, maybe this one. And I say 300, 150, 100, 75. So somewhere between 75 and 100 is the rate, but it's closer to 75. So I'll call this maybe 80 beats per minute. So rate seems to be normal. Reg, re, uh, the rhythm seems to be regular. And it appears that there are some P waves in front of those QRS complexes. We'll need to verify that they're sinus P waves. When I look at the QRS, it seems like the QRS might be wide. So if I look at the QRS duration, maybe a little bit greater than 120 milliseconds, or greater than 120, or three small boxes, excuse me. So we've got a regular wide complex rhythm at 80 beats per minute, so it's not a wide complex tachycardia. Wide complex rhythm rhythms, we think of a uh, uh, sinus rhythm with a bundle branch block or um, some type of ventricular, like an accelerated idioventricular rhythm, but we said we maybe got some P waves here, and so let's check out those P waves. The P waves appear to be upright in lead one, and they appear to be upright in AVF, and so what does that tell me? Well, if my, my sinus node, which is sitting right here high in the right atria, depolarizes from high in the right atria throughout, it's going to go down and to the left, and those P waves are going to be upright in lead one, they're going to be upright in AVF. So I've got an upright P wave and one in AVF, so that makes me think it's coming from the sinus node, and it appears to be before every single QRS complex. So I think this is a sinus rhythm, but we said it's a wide complex QRS, normally sinus rhythms are narrow, but we said it could be a bundle branch block. So let's briefly, just really quick, to kind of confirm that we think this is coming from the AV node down to the ventricles, because usually, you know, when the AV node depolarizes this signal and sends it down, it sends it down quickly through these Hisperkinji fibers and the left and right bundles, and it depolarizes the ventricles really fast. So there's probably a bundle branch block that's slowing down that AV node signal. And when I look at the lateral leads here in, say, V6, you've got something here, you've got this R prime. See, we've got this R prime, that little second hump in the lateral leads. And also, in leads 1 in AVL, you see you've got this R, R prime, R, R prime. That's another R prime. You can see it in AVL where it's going to come up, and then you get another second burst, right? And that R prime, it's positive, so it's telling me that signals are going towards that region. And when it's late, right, so the time, remember time is going on the x-axis, when it's happening late, so we have late forces going towards the lateral leads, leads one in AVL, and that tells me that we have a left bundle branch block. The left bundle is blocked, signal is able to travel through rapidly through the right ventricle, depolarize the right ventricle fast and narrow. And then to get to the left side, we're going to have to depolarize cell to cell, gap junction to gap junction, all the way through. It's going to take a long time, so it's going to happen late, and it's going to create a slurry wide complex rhythm because it's not taking those Hisperkinji system fibers. You're also going to notice here that we do not have a septal R wave, right? So we have loss of the septal R wave, right? And I guess it's a little R wave because the septal R wave is a little R wave. Loss of the septal R wave, right? So usually these complexes here, it's up first and then it goes down. And that's because the left bundle branch depolarizes the septum, right? So here's my transverse plane. And remember, the left bundle that's sitting right here, when it sends that signal down, it, perf it has little septal perforator fibers here that depolarize the signal from the left side to the right side, right? And so that creates a small force of depolarization. Look at the, the direction of my arrows towards these septal leads. And so that's what causes that little septal R wave. We don't have that. And that's common because when the left bundle is blocked, so does those septal depolarizing fibers, right? So it looks like we've got a left 
bundle branch block morphology that kind of helps us confirm the sinus rhythm with aberrant induction through the ventricles. Okay, let's take a look now at what our AV node is doing, and our AV node is our PR interval. And so I look here, see the P wave and the QRS, and my PR is certainly less than, uh, or it's in between rather, 120 and 200 milliseconds, which is normal. And my PR interval stays the same if I scan through all this rhythm. My PR interval stays the same. There's one P for every QRS. So I know that the AV node is working the same every single time. The last thing I want you to think about, when you see left-sided disease, let me go back to my QRS, right? We're still going to go kind of go through our algorithm. When we go through our QRS, right, and we said that the left-sided disease, left bundle branch block, well, what could cause that? Ischemic heart disease or maybe a previous MI. Um, chronic hypertension may be causing some left ventricular hypertrophy and just some strain on those fibers, right? Um, so what I'm getting at is that strain on the left ventricle is probably going to back up hemodynamically into the left atria, right? And so the left atria might get a little bit stretched, dilated, enlarged, it kind of hypertrophy itself. So I want you to always just have that in your mind. Maybe look for left atrial enlargement. And left atrial enlargement, remember, we look in V1 in V1, and in left atrial enlargement is when the P wave, the negative aspect of the P wave, is big enough to fit a one by one millimeter small box inside of it. And it looks like we can. So that is left atrial enlargement. And remember that left atrial enlargement, it's we look for that negative P wave in, in V1 that is largely negative. It's got to be a big negative. Because remember, if I look at my V1 lead, which is sitting right here, the polarization through the atria goes from the SA node here, high in the right atria, and it sends signals down through the right atria. And then there's this little bundle that connects the right and left uh, atria called Bachman's bundle. And that's where this kind of tunnels the signal to the left atria. And notice where it enters the left atria, it depolarizes kind of away. The left atria depolarizes away from V1. And so that, that depolarization in the direction away from V1 is going to create that negative aspect of V1 P wave. So if that negative aspect gets too big, too large, we can say there's too many forces going away. That's because the atria are enlarged, and remember the amplitude of our forces has to uh, do directly with the uh, volume of tissue that is conducting it itself. So just some fun little nuggets there. Um, and all right, let's take a look at our QT interval. So the next thing we need to do is look at our QT interval. I'm going to pick uh, maybe two QRSs. We'll choose these ones. Here's a QRS. Here's a QRS. I'll draw a dotted line halfway through. I want to make sure that my T wave ends before there. That's kind of my eyeball QT test in the QT Looks good. Um, we evaluated our QRS morphology. Let's take a look at pathological Q waves. Obviously, we're going to have deep Q waves in the septum. That's because we lose our septal R wave. But otherwise, I don't see any pathological Q waves here or ST or T wave changes um, that are disproportionate to the amount of normal strain that we see. So usually, we get this strain pattern in left bundle branch. So if I drew an arrow over here, that's strain. And what strain means is that we've got these kind of STT wave abnormalities in left bundle branches. So look, we've got this R, R prime, and then we've got this kind of inverted strained T wave. You can see it in the lateral leads, these strained T waves, kind of these inverted T waves. And that's whenever depolarization, um, like kind of the order of depolarization is ruined, so is the order of repolarization, right? We usually go from endocardium to epicardium, and then we repolarize from the epicardium to the endocardium. In bundle branch blocks, we don't get to do that. And so you see this kind of strain pattern. When you look for a disproportionate amount of strain, when you're looking for that ischemia and infarction, um, and that takes a lot of time to understand what is appropriate strain. So um, now that we're done with that, let's put this all together and see what we got. So we've got a sinus rhythm at a rate of 80 beats per minute. We have left atrial enlargement and a left bundle branch block. So if you have any questions about this rhythm, feel free to uh, let me know in the comments. Thank you so much. Again, uh, 
Hope you enjoy the video and if you want to support the channel, subscribe. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. We'll see you on the next ECG video. Have a great day.